Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Brandon Dolo Violet. Brandon, you ready to be great today? Yeah, let's do it. Brandon is a co founder and CEO of the air Dis disinfection technology company Violet. Brandon was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, graduating with engineering degrees from Oregon State University and the University of Washington. He started his professional career as a nuclear engineer supporting the US Navy, primarily work on the US aircraft carriers and submarines. Brandon, how are you doing today? Doing well. Glad to be here. So, Brandon, what are you focused on right now? What's, your, what's, what's, your, what's going on with you right now? So, uh, I'm leading the technology company Violet. We have an air disinfection technology, and uh, we have a pretty lean crew of uh, engineers, scientists, and kind of business development people, and we're just working to scale our technology and get it out to the world. So, Brandon, uh, talk about your time in the Navy real fast. Did you join that right out of the high school? You go to college first? How did that come about? Yeah, so interesting for me, I, I didn't actually join the Navy. So I worked for Department of Defense as a civilian. And so um, what I did was I got a chemical engineering degree, my undergrad from Oregon State, and then I joined uh, Department of the Navy as a nuclear engineer. And so what I did from the very get go of my career was I kind of integrated in with Navy units on aircraft carriers and submarines. And so my position was a uh, nuclear test engineer. Um, and so I would work with the, the naval nuclear officers and we would together lead teams in the in maintenance environments on aircraft carriers and submarines. And so like as a civilian, I was an expert of those nuclear systems while they were ripped apart. And so the, the Navy officers and the Navy and the naval sailors, they were used to them when they were operating and all put together. Um, and so what we did is we provided expertise, you know, if this pump is ripped out or inserting this new control system, here's how the system's going to operate, which is different than normal. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was kind of kind of different than a lot of uh, a lot of people you talk to, not actually in the military, but I, uh, you know, I worked hand in hand with them for about 12 years. And like I had no clue that it let, I mean, I guess I figured they let civilians on, like, on those ships, but I had no clue. I don't know if I thought a million years they let civilians on submarines. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And um, it's it's just like I said, it's mostly in shipyard environments. Um, so you're not actually out there in the ocean with them? Well, uh, so I hadn't been on a submarine, but I had colleagues that were on aircraft carriers. I, um, you know, I flew out onto an aircraft carrier in the Sea of Japan, or Japan Sea, sea of Japan. Um, did, I took an Osprey, actually, which is a really cool experience, landing on the flight deck and uh, kind of trained the crew for a week and a half as they were coming into port. So had some of those experiences, but for the most part, it was uh, when they were uh, in a dry dock or in port getting fixed up. How long you do that for? So 12 years. And that actually my whole career was doing that before, uh, jumping into this startup. I, uh, tail end of my career. Um, I wasn't doing much of that. I was more focused on innovation and technology and bringing new technologies in to, you know, into the shipyards and the Navy that could, uh, improve their performance. And you actually tell like a nuclear engineer. Yeah. Yeah. I was a nuclear engineer for, and yeah, for, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years of my 12 years. That's what I was doing was nuclear engineering. So what does, when you become a nuclear engineer besides go to school for, go to school for 35 years? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a lot of school. That's it's, you know, I'm guessing all kinds of math and formulas and scientific STEM stuff. Yeah. And, and for a job working as a nuclear engineer, engineer for the nuclear Navy, there's very specific schooling to say, okay, naval nuclear reactors, here's all of the exact parameters. Here's all of the exact systems, valves, pumps, um, control rods, all of the, all the components that go in, like you need to know it all. And so it's, it's essentially, you know, after my undergraduate degree, it was two additional years of training and testing. And we went through the same um, testing sequence. And, and when, I mean, when I say tests, I mean like eight hour written tests, like the same things that the Naval officers do. So, so no like a school. basic weaving 101, you know, <laughs> homonomics. No, none of that. It's a lot of, yeah, a lot of physics, a lot of calculus, a lot of chemistry, um, just like you'd expect. So when you're on the ship, how did, and maybe this didn't happen, but do you have a situation where like you're on the ship and you're like doing stuff and some young, you no know, dumbass lieutenant says, no, that's not the way to do it. You have to like put them in space, so to speak, or maybe somebody senior ranking, you're like, okay, I respect your, respect your rank. You do what you do, but Hey, we need to do it this way. That was actually one of the harder parts of the job was you actually had to do that a lot, but you had to do it in a way that was re very respectful because you were not in their chain of command. And so, yeah, sometimes it would be a master chief or a lieutenant commander, 
kind of giving an order to do something that was not going to be the best in the current situation because the you know everybody I worked with extremely knowledgeable dedicated like I was honored to work with uh, the Navy in the way that I was. But when you come into port and you start removing systems that are normally there, there's dangers that weren't there before and it's not in their normal day to day. And so that's why I, I was there to make sure that the steps we were taking were keeping people safe. And so, yeah, it, that was kind of a daily occurrence, unfortunately. And so I don't know if most people know this, but most nuclear, I mean, most Navy ships nuclear powered. So aircraft carriers and submarines, uh, th those are the ones that are at this point. Yeah. So if you see uh, any other type of ship, they're going to be conventionally powered. There was other types of ships that are nuclear powered kind of in the past, but we've uh, just honed into aircraft carriers and submarines. Submarines, you get the most value because you can go underwater for six months and not need to resurface. Aircraft carriers, um, less value, but still, still kind of really important to be able to do it on nuclear power, not conventional. Um, but yeah, those are the two that it's limited to. So with nuclear energy, you know, of course, there's no all the rising gas prices. People talk about, you know, solo clean energy, nuclear. Everyone says nuclear is the best option, of course, like the, you know, what if factor, right? But yeah. I, I could be wrong, but has there ever been like a quote unquote accident with nuclear energy in the Navy that you can, t that ever happened or can be told about? Uh, no, there, there hasn't been a major issue in the nuclear Navy, and that's why it's been such a successful program. But the reality of why is because from the very start, it was set up to be uh, every decision was, was treated with um, a, a much higher level of thought and intensity. So like even the very small things like uh, Admiral Rickover, um, I'm sure plenty of people are familiar with him. He's, you know, the father of the nuclear Navy for the United States. And he set up the system where, you know, you could not live with deficiencies, even if they were really small. Like if you take this really small issue and it's not hurting anything now and you let it go, it turns into a bigger issue. And then it turns into an issue that can have an impact on the reactor plant. And so what we did is we treated those tiny little issues like they were a fire and we put it out right away. So then it never got to a point where there was a major issue. Um, you know, components fail, things like that happen, but there's a significant amount of uh, training and leadership in place to handle those types of situations. And the training is beyond what you'd ever expect, you know, drills and, you know, all the school and stuff, everybody's ready for any situation. And so anything that could happen in those plants, there's a procedure and those procedures memorized by the sailors and by the civilians that are working with them so that you just immediately jump on it. And it's something that did happen. I can imagine a public relations nightmare that would happen to the Navy or the United States government. Yeah, absolutely. It, it'd be, it'd be really bad. Um, and so, you know, that there's a huge focus there and it's for a reason because, you know, we need those reactor plants to maintain, be maintained safe and they have a really solid, you know, 50, 60 plus year track record of maintaining safe operations. How about, how about radiation levels on the ships? Are you concerned about that? <clears throat> yeah, no, not, not really. Um, so over time, they've gotten stricter and stricter in the requirements of what personnel can get when they're working. And so, you know, it, it's all kind of privileged, confidential information. But what I can say is, you know, in my 12 year career, I got less radiation than a airplane flight type of thing. So it's, um, you know, depending on what you're doing, you'll get next to nothing, even if you're right next to the reactor plants. Um, but yeah, I won't, I won't go too crazy into that. Cause I, I don't want to get myself in trouble or anything. Yeah, no, they, do, they do a really good job. It's all shielded and it's all, um, the procedures prevent people from putting themselves in situations where they get radiated. So let's suppose you're in the summer for six months, you get some radiation on you. Does that radiation then decrease once you go away from the radiation source or once you have radiation, you just always, always with you. So there's a differentiation between contamination and radiation. So contamination would be something that's constantly putting out energy, which is, and the energy itself is the radiation. So um, if you're exposed to radiation in the reactor plant, it's going to have, you know, if it's a very small amount, it'll have a minimal effect. If it was a large amount, you know, you see Chernobyl and those things it has reaching impacts to your body because it's essentially, you know, gamma rays going in and kind of like rupturing cells in your body because it goes straight through everything. Um, but once you go away from the source of the radiation, which is reactor plant or those materials, you're not, you're not being uh, impacted by it at all. If there was a contamination source that you like ingested or had on you and then you left, that would continue to put out radiation over time. But that's something that's controlled extremely heavily. Any contamination sources are, uh, they don't leave. They don't leave the ship. Do you have to know what percent of the world gets their energy from nuclear or what percent of the United States gets their energy from nuclear? You know, 
I don't I'm guessing, I guess it's, I guess head, it's pretty it's, low. It is pretty low. And it's, you know, it's, it's an industry that uh, was very heavily impacted by a couple of, you know, Chernobyl, mm -hmm. Three Mile Island, some of those accidents in Fukushima recently, mm -hmm. right? So um, when, when the stars align and a, a bunch of these things happen in a room, when you don't have systems like the nuclear Navy has, where you have this process that when, when something like this happens, these are the actions you take, you know, it's it's one of those things where it turns into a kind of a PR, a news type of thing. Whereas the reality of it is over the length of the technology, it's actually very safe compared to other energy sources. But when things go wrong, it's, you know, uh, you make a movie on it, yeah. right? It's, it's I mean, auto level. pop lines, they leak all the time, right? Yep. You know, the spills uh, all the time. There's BP, Exxon Valdez. I mean, this. It's still like almost every year, there's an oral incident. It happens somewhere. much more often, and the reality of like the deaths that come of it and those types of things. The second, actually, third order effects. Yep, it's it's more with other energy sources, but it's not as newsworthy. So that's that's the effect, and that's one of the reasons why nuclear power is not as adopted is because, you know, Godzilla and movies. <laughs> that, right, that's what people think of. Um, it's not actually the case because technology is advanced and safety systems have advanced to a level where you can do it very safely. With the Navy having so much success, how come like civilian agencies aren't copying like everything the Navy's doing? They try to, they do, they do. Like we, uh, they talk to each other. Um, I would say one one of the things it's not extremely cost effective to be as safe as the Navy is. There's a lot of extra levels. Yeah, because the Navy doesn't um, have to worry about profit, revenue generation. They're just like mission rating this. Exactly. So it costs a little more. Um, but you know, in the long term, the, the energy lasts a very long time. So you're not paying that recurring cost for fuel, things like that. But um, yeah, it's the way the Navy does it isn't cheap, but it works well as from a safety perspective. That's why it's it can't be exactly replicated by private industry because they're always going to say like, okay, yeah, it's great to second and third check everything, but we can't afford to do that. So they don't. Yeah, how about this? So so I grew up in a town called Odessa, Texas, in the West Texas, like basically desert. I remember there was like this thing, they're going to bring that nuclear waste facility right there. And of course, everyone was up in arms, not in our neighborhood, you and a clever thing. And people were like, well, there's nothing here anyway. What's the use, right? Yeah. But is there really a danger of having nuclear waste facilities like within your neighborhood? Because is it like locked in like vaults and concrete and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, the things you're saying is true. So when they, when they have a waste facility, and I'm not an expert in that. I haven't worked in a waste facility, but, um, you know, we would ship... Um, you know, anytime there was kind of nuclear waste, you know, there are facilities that it ships to. And you're right, in any community that has a potential, you know, they don't want it because because of the image, right? And but the reality of it is, yes, you know, it's gonna be an extreme build out. You know, they're gonna have massive containment, uh, containment meaning like you know, really thick barriers around any of the materials. So the radiation's not escaping um, and the materials are kind of sitting in this enclosed space, um, but it's the image of it that nobody wants. So it isn't, doesn't it last like 10,000 billion years or something too? Yeah. So it decays slowly. So that's why you kind of go let it sit over there and, and sit for a while. Yeah. So it's like the, the level of radiation that's coming out over time is less and less and less, but something's still coming out over time. So that's kind of the thing is it, the, for the when it goes to you know as close to zero as you can get that does that takes a long time what do you see as the future of nuclear energy in the united states i think there's some promising startups in uh the nuclear industry that are going to become more and more prominent especially with you know as you know there's less uh, fuel reserves and again I'm, I'm not an expert in the energy space either but i do think it'll be more embraced once it can be once one of these startup companies with kind of small modular reactors that's kind of this new phase you don't have this 20 billion dollar upfront cost for this it's a lot less because they're small modular you can put one or 20 depending on how much energy you need um once we get some of those installed and proven i think it'll take off uh, I think it'll become more prevalent. It, it takes a lot of years. That's kind of maybe decades away that it's taking off, but um, there's some really promising technology. So tell us from your point of view, one positive thing about nuclear energy and then one negative thing about, positive, about nuclear energy. So positive is that you have this really long lasting source of energy that is not having the same impact on the climate as a lot of the other sources of energy. And it's not impacted by the sun being up or, you know, and if you're in the Pacific Northwest and it's cloudy, you don't, it's solar's not working, none of those impacts. So it's going to be a reliable, constant source of energy that we can use that can keep the world going. Um, 
and then you know the the negative thing that we need to work through is uh it has a, it has a, ma a major stain on a pr stain and it's not easily going to be accepted by the world and so there's a lot of work to do to get people to the point where they're going to be willing to uh, you know easily adopt this technology and so you know and, and there's there's still technical challenges there's still they still need to do better about um placement and and how they're implementing kind of the waste storage and things like that like we'll continue to improve that as a country um but in general the adoption is going to just be continue to be really hard so for your nuclear engineering degree do you have to like do classes once a year to keep up date on all the nuclear tech stuff or how does that work with you so when i was when I was working as a nuclear engineer, it's a yeah, continuous qualification. So essentially you, you're, you know, you're doing the job, um, but you, you go back to school and you repeat some of the, some of the tests and the material that you went through to make sure you're maintaining your level of knowledge. Um, and if you don't, you actually can't do the job anymore. It's really, really strict. It's actually very competitive to get into it too. Um, so everybody that starts this program has an engineering degree and they were typically close to the top of their class or doing very well. Um, and it's a small percentage of those people that hire in that actually qualify to do that job of nuclear test engineer. A lot of, a lot of people can't get through the rigor of the testing. Uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And then you go back every one to two years um, and uh, if you don't pass those same tests, you go find another job. So Brandon, some people would say that engineers think differently, do things differently, that you might be a little bit weird, right? Can you talk yeah. about that, how, <laughs> how the engineer mindset is a little different from other people? I think the engineer is constantly kind of questioning what's going on and how it's happening and why it's happening instead of just taking things at face value, they, they ask one or two more questions. Um, and sometimes that'll lead to or uncover something that wouldn't have been otherwise. So, um, you know, it's, it's good and bad, right? Uh, it's very annoying to some people, um, but uh, in certain situations, it's extremely valuable uh, to, you know, kind of like validate. It, it's a constant validation of like, does this make sense, right? So talk about the process of deciding to leave your job with the Navy to start doing your startup. Like, why do you decide to leave? I mean, the Navy is basically a corporation. Why do you decide to leave corporate America to do a startup? It was a tough decision. Uh, working for Department of Defense, great benefits, good salary, really good job security. It was very exciting work. Uh, like I said, I was, you know, taking Ospreys onto aircraft carriers in the middle of the ocean periodically and traveling to Japan a lot and San Diego and some cool places. Um, but uh, in the latter part of my career, I mentioned I was doing innovation and technology and um, effectively the pandemic started and we had all these critical workers that had to be in these spaces uh, working on aircraft carriers and submarines so they couldn't be remote like the rest of the world was starting to do and so we're like how do we keep them safe um, and so i was helping to lead a team of engineers and technologists to say like okay what are some good solutions to keep them safe because they have to be there we don't want them to quit we need this work done it's critical for national security what are we going to do and so you know we were testing solutions on pathogens and Navy laboratories and saying like what works and what doesn't. Um, and essentially kind of like learned a lot about, okay, most of these solutions don't actually work very well. Um, and they weren't going to be keeping those workers safe. Uh, learned, a, learned a lot about UVC light. It's a, essentially a wavelength of light that has germicidal properties. So it'll disrupt DNA and RNA in viruses and bacteria and other pathogens. Um, learned how it worked it was typically working well on surfaces. So if you have a UVC source and you do this over a surface, it's gonna kill what's there, but it takes a certain amount of time for it to work. And so I learned a lot about like how much time it takes and what the drawbacks are of that. And then I saw when it was implemented in air handling systems. So like in an air purifier with UVC light, for example, I, I learned that it didn't work in that case because there wasn't enough time for that UVC light to actually kill the germs that were in the air. And so, there was a point where um, we'd done all this work, we identified these surface disinfectors, but the CDC came out and was saying, hey, surfaces don't really matter for this pandemic, it's airborne, right? It's in the air. And so I had learned these airborne solutions don't work. UVC light does work, but you have to harness it correctly. And then um, took some time and was able to uh, 
have have developed this this system that properly harnesses UVC light. So it gives the air inside the system enough time for that light to kill the germs that are in the air and then have clean air come out. And so it was kind of a, an aha moment that, okay, we can use this technology for air in a way that nobody else is, but, but how do we, how do we, how do I transition to that as a, as a full-time gig? Like that's the process. And so that was, uh, I don't know, 10 months of, you know, here's the idea, here's the technology, here's the prototype, here's the patent submitted, um, starting to build a team, starting to do some investment, still while doing double duty, you know, doing the startup and doing the full-time job. Um, and then there comes a time where you realize you just can't do both if you're going to be successful. Like to take the leap in the startup, um, it needed to be a more than full-time effort and I, you just can't do it with a full-time job. And so um, it was really when we started to get some customer traction and customer validation of the technology and have revenue come in the door and have interested and in, an in investment in the door. That's when it was like, okay, this is a company, this is a business and it's viable. So make the transition. It was a hard decision though. So question for you, since you started this for you in the Navy, no one in the Navy said, Hey, this is Navy technology, the Navy solution. You can't take it with you. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting differentiation because we didn't invent any of this technology with the Navy. What we did was we studied UVC light which is 80, 100 year old technology. Um, and that's not really IP or patentable, but what I did outside of the Navy was I said, how does that germicidal light source get harnessed in a, something that's moving air through a system? And so outside of the Navy, that's, that's what I developed. And that's, that's what Violet owns for IP is, is just an air handling system. That's what the patent is. It's not UVC light per, per se. So for those that don't know, what's a pa pathogen? A, a pathogens, in other words, for germ. I should stop saying it because it's <laughs> a little too technical of a term. It's just a, a germ. It it's sounds a, germ. a little more scientific. Yeah. And, and like, I'm guessing like the microscopic size. Yeah. So a virus, bacteria, yeah. mold spore, protozoa, any of those things are pathogenic, which means they're gonna they're gonna come try and harm you as a human being. They're gonna get inside of you and try and harm you. And we don't want that to happen. So we try to kill them. And so the UV light gets just, just destroys it, or does it destroy it, or does it like make it into another component? So it prevents it from reproducing, so it dies. So it disrupts the DNA and RNA, so it can't go serve its purpose. Every virus goes out and just tries to reproduce in human cells. And UVC light prevents it from reproducing. And when it does that, it effectively gives it a death sentence. Um, and it's actually been proven, UVC light's been proven to kill every pathogen or germ that it's ever experienced. So there's no, there's no UVC light resistant germ on earth that we've tested so far, you know, maybe in the future, but all indications point that like you give this light enough time because it, it can, it can make it through any kind of outer barrier. Um, it'll, it'll go kill the germs. And is pathogens and bacteria, are those the same thing or those are different things? A bacteria is similar to a virus, similar to a mold. They're all examples of a pathogen. So okay. bacteria is the same. It'll kill bacteria as well. And I think most people don't know that we're actually filled with, with the bacteria ourselves, right? Yes. Yep. There's, there's bacteria that, uh, have a, a good, uh, purpose in life and, you know, they help our gut and they help a lot of things. Um, you know, the stuff that's in the air that we're breathing, um, that's typically not the source where we're getting good bacteria from the stuff that's in the air that we're breathing. Um, you know, that's, that's the stuff that's going to make you sick, right? That's where, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus floating in the air, that's what we care about right now, but the flu, pneumonia, anything that kind of floats around that you can breathe in, uh, that's what we want to eliminate. So what exactly is UV, UV light? Is this a natural occurring thing that's in the sky or like, where does it come from? How does it operate? If you look at a spectrum of light, um, you know, there's visible light and then there's uh, non-visible light. And that's where ultraviolet, the UV spectrum is. And so essentially you, people are familiar with the light coming from the sun that they get exposed to on earth UVA and UVB light. UVC is just past that on the spectrum. The, the wavelength is, um, you know, the 200 to 280 nanometers where you have this sweet spot of UVC light that's germicidal, meaning that it kills germs. So it has that, it has that uh, property where it can go make it through the outer layer of a, 
of a germ and kill it. And so there's a very specific wavelength of light that does this very effectively. And um, there are naturally occurring sources of UV light. So like, um, you know, if you take mercury and you do some things with it, it'll put out light at 254 nanometers. And so that's in the UV spectrum. And that's the most typical application of this is mercury bulbs that put out 254 nanometer light. Um, in the last five years, there's been advancements in LED technologies where you can really fine tune the wavelength of light being put out so to where right now you can have LEDs that'll put out this really tight spectrum of the most germicidal light. Um, and so it's it's starting to take off because uh, it's it's easier to harness now than it ever has been before. So even though it was around for 80 years and like proven to kill things, there hasn't really been a very effective way to utilize it until fairly recently. So Brandon, what, what is a black light at on the spectrum? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's going to be, uh, that's, oh, let me, let me think. That's, that's a, I think that's like four to 800 nanometers. I don't quote me on that. It's not in the germicidal <laughs> aspect there. So it's not. Uh, so don't use black light to try to kill germs. No, right? no. And there, there's <laughs> products that do that. If you, if so, uh, ultraviolet uh, UVC light is non-visible. So if you're using a light source and you're shining around and it looks purple, that's not UVC light. And maybe there's a little bit of UVC light in there, but anything you see, any purple you see, that's in the visible spectrum and that's not killing germs. So Brandon, talk about your like your aha moment where you said, okay, I might have something now. Let me talk to the family about, you know, getting quote unquote quitting my my paying job and like going on and like what what happened? Like you to number of customers, revenue, or just like people telling you, hey, you got something you need to go all in. What what did it for you? You know, I think it was the combination of having a product that was physically produced and working as expected combined with talking to, so, so we decided to go after the most, you know, and try to help the most vulnerable populations first. So we looked out and said, okay, elder care and healthcare have a higher burden than the rest of the world does right now, as far as needing to keep them safe. Um, you know, maybe, you know, education might be in there as well with kids that aren't able to get vaccinated, things like that. But uh, we started B2B going to those vulnerable populations. And when I started to talk to nursing homes, assisted living homes, skilled nursing facilities, healthcare facilities, and I was hearing about their problems and hearing about the solutions they were going after. Um, and, and also hearing that they knew that the, the really good solutions didn't, they weren't available to them. Um, and also seeing the very quick uh, interest that they showed in our technology because it, we were kind of providing something that they'd been looking for and they, they quickly realized that. And so, you know, that combined with the product, combined with interest from investors, combined with um, really like this passionate team that was starting to form, like these people that um, I was talking with and starting to work with that were just, you know, extremely passionate to make this a thing. Like all of those things came together to the point where it's like, okay, um, if, if this isn't a full-time thing, it's going to go too slow and we can do this fast. We can do this right. If we give it a go. Um, yeah. And the family part, that's, that's definitely, um, not, nothing to gloss over. So I have a, I have a wife and I have two young kids. And so, um, you know, luckily my wife has a good job. And so it wasn't kind of like, we'll be out on the streets if this doesn't work, but still uh, a very large thing. And um, talk, talk about your sales process. Cause I have to imagine like you went to like a nursing home, out of care place and you try to sell your products. I just imagine saying like, what is this? You know, like this, this doesn't work. You're like, you're a brand new person. You have no proof of concept. Like, how do you do the sales process for your first few customers? Yeah, we were very upfront with it. Um, we have, a new advanced technology. Here's what it is. Here's how it works. And so what we made sure we did was we had the right people in the room there. So, okay, sorry. First thing we did, find warm intros. Don't go beat down somebody's door that has no idea what they're talking about. So we went through and we found some connections that, that gave us warm intros to these organizations that had a need in elder care. You know, they uh, had people getting sick, they had people dying, they had their staff quitting, they had all this stuff going on. And we had a solution that could help. And so somebody said, hey, here's this, you know, here's this technology that we've taken a look at and it looks interesting. You guys should take a look. And so that so we already had that warm intro, which is critical as an early startup to not say, hey, I promise you it works. Like having somebody else vet you first 
to the customer. That's hugely important. And then once we were in the door, what we did was we we found who would be essentially considered like an infectious disease control specialist. It might be a nurse, it might be the facilities person, but whoever is thinking about that, they need to be in the room, or at least for us they did, um, with say the executive director, the final decision maker. And then combined together, you know, we're talking about the technology and how it works. The, inf the infectious disease person's like, this sounds great. Like I've, this is what I've been looking for. And then the executive director is kind of like looking at them, like, are you sure you think this will work? Um, and so, but on our side, we're, we were up front. We're like, you're going to be, you're going to be some of our first customers. Um, so this is essentially, you know, you're getting it on the bottom floor. You're able to try this new advanced technology um, and you'll be a part of shaping it. So we, that was also a piece of it is, you know, the feedback you give will shape this product that we believe is going to transform air disinfection. Um, and so that was a piece that some of these groups are very excited about too, being able to give the feedback and implement the things they would want to see that would be important for them and their, their residents. So basically they're like your first beta testers. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was important for us to show revenue and show that people would pay for the product. And so it was, it was beta testers, it was pilots, but it was paid pilots. They paid for the products. And we, um, you know, from that point, you know, we got to work on manufacturing because we'd built a product, but then we needed to build a lot of products to go deliver to customers. And, you know, a, a lot of people have said the same thing, you know, building a prototype is easy, building a, you know, manufacturing is hard. It's totally true. Um, it was a lot of, uh, you know, all night work weeks and, um, you know, our, our core team just being extremely, extremely busy and focused solely on that for a while. Um, but we got to a point where we had a process down and we were kind of building and churning them out um, and delivering to these those first customers. And then uh, also kind of at the same time working towards, okay, how do we outsource the manufacturing piece so that we're not killing ourselves with our core team? And, so and all your customers, are you focused on the Seattle area right now? Yeah, we've been focused on Washington. Washington State. Yeah, all our customers are in Washington State. We have a uh, we have a uh, customer in Yakima. We have a customer in Lacey. Customer in Seattle. Uh, a few in Seattle. So it, it's uh, all in Washington State, though. Can you talk about the engineering aspect of the product? Like, is it is this like the new technology? Is this is it rocket scientists or just like you're just reusing old technology in a better way? So the air handling system. So the way that we move air through our system. That's the new part. So what we do is we bring air in and we maximize the amount of time that that air is in that chamber with UVC light. And so we pull air in and we force this vortex flow that is designed to keep the air there for as long as possible. And then, you know, we also optimized their reflectivity in that chamber. So like the UVC light's not getting soaked up in materials, it's bouncing around until it hits a virus. And then maximizing the intensity of UVC light as well. Those are all dials you can turn to increase your effectiveness. And so what we did is we optimized all of those to create this system that does the best that it can do. And so RIP specifically, how it's different than everybody else is uh, nobody else can create the residence time that we can. So, so anybody else can maximize intensity and reflectivity, but if you just shoot air through it really quickly, neither of those matter because you need the amount of time for the UVC light to interact with the pathogens and kind of break through that outer shell. You can think of it that way. Um, and so that's, that's our special sauce. So we hold the air inside of there for long enough before it goes through and back out into the space clean. Why do you think no one thought of that before? Because to me, it's like pretty simple or, you know, pretty reasonable to do. How come no one's done that before you think? Well, I think it was a few things like one, um, the availability of high intensity, densely packed emitters, that's new. So there was a finite period of time of when that technology was becoming available and people were really trying to do this, um, you know, it was a short window and we started right, right away. Like those, we were kind of like some of the first uh, people using some of the more advanced emitters for UVC light. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I can't really say why nobody thought of it before. It's, uh, it's a combination of the engineering backgrounds that we had with the people that were working on this, that were able to kind of hack together a design that completely optimizes it. So every everybody else, um, I, I think maybe a part of it too was the in-depth studying of UVC light too. So um, 
understanding that if you don't have the residence time that the UVC light doesn't actually work. Most companies took the step of just putting a UVC emitter in a standard air purifier. You have the, and they typically have a filter and a uh, fan and you just blow air through a filter and back out. And they just took the easy route and inserted the UVC bulb inside of that device and then put the product out. I think it was kind of like most groups uh, wanted to get something out as fast as possible which has its value, right? And they, a lot of them got initial sales, but it's not, uh, it's not a way to create a technology that's gonna stick because it's not actually performing the effectiveness. It's not gonna be able to go get third-party independent testing and say, this is better than anything else, because it's not. And so, um, yeah, it was just a combination of the right timing on, of our team of technologically technological advancements in the UVC space um, and then, just putting in the hard push and time to optimize that system. Can you talk about the process of getting your IP and your patent? Um, so I was lucky enough to have a really, um, really good family friend who is uh, excellent legal uh, advice. And so um, he connected me with a really good IP attorney. And, um, and that was kind of the first thing that was done was we had, you know, here's the idea, here's how it worked, patent it. Um, and so submitted a provisional patent up front, which uh, essentially what that means is it allows you to go say patent pending, but it also um, gives you a year period. It's a lot cheaper to do. Um, you know, you can, you can submit a provisional patent um, with your core claims in it, but it doesn't need to be in a finely polished form that you'd submit the utility patent for. Um, a lot cheaper, you can do it quickly and it gives you a year period where if you submit your full utility patent within that year period, your, your date of submittal is in the beginning of that provisional patent. So it's kind of like protecting the date essentially. So we did that. Um, and then just under a year later, submitted the full utility patent. But uh, yeah, I was, I was lucky to just have good legal advice from the get go. And that was based on a, based on a connection I had in my network. Yeah. Some people don't realize how much luck plays a part in all this, right? Just the luck, the connections. Yeah. I, you know, in this case, I would say, luck of having that personal connection because he's actually uh an old family friend like he's my 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 dad's friend from growing up and he just happens to be in seattle and has, happens to be a startup attorney but in general i would say a uh, vast majority of my experience in the startup it wasn't luck it was more the work done before starting the company to network and Which have sets you up for luck sets you up for luck yeah it's kind of like you build the luck in uh, by building a network uh, but in this case, yeah, it was just a family connection. So when you first made the product, were the first few of them like handmade or how, how did that happen? And they what kind of, been, and if you can't, what kind of material is in it? They've all been handmade. Okay. All uh, of them so far? All of them so far. Um, so we, uh, yeah, so, so we build, we build it. Uh, and you're making this at your house, I'm guessing, or somewhere? We have an office. Okay. We, we started in a garage uh, and got to a point where we all needed to be working together, like this, this kind of core team that we have. Um, and so we have a, we started in a prototype space and um, actually uh, University of Washington. I'm in mean, that space. Yeah. So yeah. the hardware. Yeah. That would be, that's a great space. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, they have shared equipment, they have space that can, that you can own and be yours, but it's like really large. And so we were able to do a lot of things there, um, you know, building the initial products, prototypes. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've added space since then that we have a little more control over and we can do more of our final assembly at. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's mostly, uh, plastic with some metal in the device. Um, you know, obviously we have a blower unit in there to move the air. We have our UVC emitters. We have some kind of more proprietary materials for reflectivity. Um, and yeah, we do a lot of 3d printing we have up until now. So, um, a lot of our plastic parts, um, in the unit we designed and we were 3d printing them. And then since then we've had, we've optimized those for injection molding and we're just about ready to begin injection molding our product, which, uh, for anybody that's 3d printed great for iterating designs and quick changes just takes a really, really long time. Uh, we had some parts that were, you know, 20 hour prints. Um, you know, and so you 20 hours. And so to scale that you just need a bunch of printers and we have a lot of printers now, but, um, there's a, there's a ceiling on what you can do with that. And so, you know, we intentionally sold, um, you know, less than what people wanted 
up front. We didn't, you know, if somebody wanted uh, 50, we sold them 30, you know, and just kind of like level setting, like we don't want, we don't want to take forever to deliver this. Uh, you know, it still takes a while, like, you know, it still took a while um, to get all, all of this uh, built and um, shipped out. But uh, injection molding takes that 20 hour print and it gets, gives it to you in a minute. Is there a cost difference between 3D printing and doing the other method? Yeah, so it's it's a different way of looking at it. So a 3D printer, you can the, for the products that we're doing, we don't need super expensive 3D printers. So we can get a thousand dollar 3D printer and it'll make good parts for us. Um, but it takes you know five, 10, 20 hours per part. And then injection molding, what you do is you spend an upfront cost for tooling. And so it's essentially it it builds this tooling that has this cavity in there that's your exact part, and then it just injects plastic into there and forms it and then it opens up and the part falls out and it does it again over and over it's an automated process with a big machine um so there's an upfront cross to build that tool though to make it work and that tool has a lifetime but if you do it right the lifetime's like three hundred thousand plus parts so it'll last for a very long time but it's expensive so 3d printer thousand bucks up front long time to make each part injection molding you know all it can it can vary, but let's just say fifty thousand dollars for a for the tool. That's a lot of money for a startup. A lot of money for a startup up front. That's the reason why we didn't we weren't able to do it right away. But also, even if we had the money, it wouldn't have been smart to do, because um, there's so many things that change as you get feedback from your customers and you learn new things. It's a great want, point. Yeah. You want to be able to make those changes quickly, and with a three D printer, you can make that change and print a new part tomorrow or even the same day or inject the other way you got to spend another 50,000 exactly yeah and you wow. it's hard to it's a, that's a pretty big sunk cost so you might not make the change you might not make the improvements if you have the tooling already paid for and so we push that off um, about as long as we can but you know it also it limits our ability to sell so it's a it's a balance and so let's the order start coming let's please you start getting like ten thousand dollars a month i'm guessing the plans i kind of outsource to another manufacturing or are you going to do everything internally no, so our plan up front is to have a contract manufacturer and injection molding. Um, that's the that's the next phase for our business. We're still keeping it in Washington State. Uh, we were lucky enough to find some really strong manufacturing connections um, to be able to work with and keep some amount of control over the process. Good communication. We're able to limit our IP risk of sending our tooling to China or overseas, where they could potentially take it and start producing another product and have it show up on a marketplace over there without our knowing about mm -hmm. it. Or even if we know about it, it doesn't really matter. Um, and also uh, transportation and shipping and logistics, that's all really hard overseas right now. There's huge delays. Ships are sit sitting, coming from China. It's taking a very long time. Um, so we can kind of minimize that by staying local with our manufacturing. So, so the product now, the materials you make with it now, is a plan to keep making the same materials or once you start getting a better and better products in to maybe upgrade the material? There are some components that we know we'll be able to upgrade uh, with some more R&D and investment um, and also at, at scale. Um, so there's, there, yeah, very few specific parts that we know we'll be able to make improvements on. Um, some of them, uh, we, we feel like we've sourced the best material that's gonna be available for us. Um, but yeah, the, the reality of our technology is that uh, it actually can be packaged in a lot of ways. It's, it's a platform technology. So we have it currently as a portable unit. So you can flexibly deploy it out, plug it into a wall and it works. You know, you can plug it in in here. And even if you had central HVAC, even if you didn't, it doesn't matter, you can still use it. Um, but obviously there's plenty of cases where you want it to be built in. And so we have, um, a couple of those solutions where they can be built into a new build or retrofit into an old building um, where you don't want to take up floor or tabletop space. You just want it to be working, right? And so those are kind of the next steps and the materials and the specifics of our current product won't translate over, but the core technology will. The core technology moves over and maybe it's made out of metal and you build it into the ceiling, um, but it's working the same. So talk about how you built your team for the startup, how that come about. Well, I talked about the the networking before you ever start it part. Like uh, I I would say that might be the most important part of any of this. So uh, you're not gonna do be able to do any of it successfully on your own, no matter how smart and hardworking you are. There's, you're just gonna be limited in what you can do. So you need to have people that are ready to that 
that trust you, that believe in you and are ready to help you out when you're ready for them to help you out. And you do that by reaching out and providing support and help to other people without asking for anything in return. Um, you know, have, have a network of people that, uh, you know, would be excited to help. And so I experienced some of that. Uh, I had a lot of, you know, I, I can't come from the engineering background. I know a lot of smart people and, um, there was a lot of people that were ready to kind of jump and help out wherever they could. Um, some of that's translated into, you know, starting to bring them on full time. Some of that is an advisory capacity for the company. Um, all of it's all of it's been really valuable. But um, you know, I, I brought on an engineer that I'd worked with before, um, that I trusted, that I knew his skill set, and I knew that he had the skills that we needed. Um, but even more so, I knew that he had the right attitude. Um, so in a startup. I would say maybe the most important thing above, you know, experience is going to be uh, the attitude and the willingness to put in the work that's needed in a startup. Because no matter who you are, it's going to be more than you ever expected. It's, it it's not a nine to five. No, it's more than any day job you've ever worked. There's, you know, it's all riding on your shoulders. If, if you have a bad day, there's nobody else to pick it up. Um, and there's a lot of people that, um, aren't don't want that i'm not going to say they couldn't do it but they don't want it and if there's other choices like a regular good paying job you know they'll learn quickly that that's i mean it's a big risk to work for a startup whether you're a founder or just a regular employee it's a big risk it's a huge risk yeah and so you need to one be extremely invested and in, you need to find people that are just really excited and invested in what you're doing and they think it's going to change the world because then they'll want to go you know join you to change the world right that needs to like the mission driven aspect and being passionate, that's huge. Um, yes, they need to have some semblance of the skill set you need, definitely. They need to be, you know, you'll hear people say you need to hire the A plus team or else you'll fail. Um, but there's only, people don't, there's only so many A plus players out there, right? There is, yeah. And so you need to, you need to look past experience and find the right mentalities and the right people that you think are going to grit it out with you and put in the really hard nights and not have it destroy you, right? If you have somebody that um, would easily give up, they are gonna give up, <laughs> right? They're, go they're just going to, they're gonna quit because uh, it's hard. Um, and the reality of it too is you want to have the people at the front pushing really hard because that's what's gonna lead to a startup being successful or not. If you have uh, you know, low expectations, low ambition, you, you, know, you don't push really hard, other companies are going to beat you. And so for, as an employee, you know, it's in their best benefit to have a leader that's pushing really hard, but if the employee can't handle that because they're not used to it, because of their day job, that kind of thing, they'll burn out just quickly. So from your point of view, is it better to have like an A plus person who's, you know, they're in, but not really all in, they're doing their best, but if they're, you know, they take it or leave it or B minus players like all in 24 seven, so, you know, it, it, for me, I, my weighting scale is based on um, the investment and the effort they're going to put in, because I definitely believe that, um, you know, people can learn and grow from where they are. So, you know, I would say if you're looking at it based on a resume and this resume is an A plus, this one's a B minus, and this one's going to be all in, this one's going to be half in, B minus resume. But, but my grading scale is not on the resume, it's on the effort and the uh, mentality they're gonna bring to the startup, coupled with the fact that they have some of the skill set and they're gonna add more and more to it. You know, you have to be strategic there because if you're a founder that doesn't have, if there's nobody on the team to teach, then you, know, you, can't, you can't take somebody that's never done it before, but you also don't need somebody that's done it five times before, Yeah. right? Uh, so how many people are on your team right now? So we only have three full-time, but we have about 13 part-time. So we've okay. been um, utilizing a lot of expertise in sales, in manufacturing. Uh, we've actually uh, had a number of interns from University of Washington um, that we've brought on and it, it, for UX design, like building, our, building out a mobile app. That's something I don't talk about a ton. Uh, we haven't launched it yet, but um, we're going to be able to remotely control our device and have embedded sensors that show pathogen sensing and air quality uh, sensing, which is going to be a great feedback loop for customers. Um, but yeah, number of interns, a uh, number of really solid people that are 
at this point ready to step up to full time when we're ready to bring them on, which is great because um, you can't hire everybody right away. You just can't afford to. But as long as you have people that are excited to join when we're ready, and that's kind of what we've tried to set up. And we have, in my mind, we have a really, really cross-functional and uh, great team that uh, is kind of ready to step up now. We're doing some fundraising now to be able to support growing that team. Yeah, so the people in your team, uh, do you have a person who connects to all of them? Or is anyone on your team someone you didn't know before this? Yeah, so my, my co-founder, um, she uh, Jesse Perez, she's a PhD molecular biologist, and I actually met her through an entrepreneurial group in UW. So for me, I'm always of the mentality of um, taking advantage of every opportunity that's out there. And up front, as an engineer turned entrepreneur, a lot of that was entrepreneurial. So I did a Wharton Business School entrepreneurship class and met a big network of people there, learned a lot. I did this uni University of Washington co-motion system uh, entrepreneurial coaching class. And that was actually game changing for me and for the company too. There's, um, you know, Dr. Perez, my, my co-founder, um, Nisi Hilton, uh, she ran that entrepreneurial program and she'd been selling and partnering in elder care for years. And so, you know, partnered with her and she started to help out with initial sales. And then I got an advisory board member out of that too, a two-time CEO um, in health tech companies, um, Carla Corcoran. And, and each one of them, they're like rock stars. And it, it was all based on just my, uh, my decision to go do this entrepreneurial kind of like networking coaching program where it was like, you know, eight weeks of meet every week, talk. Um, it was pretty early on, but like, you know, we hit it off and uh, they really liked what we were doing and wanted to be a part of it. Um, so each one of those, never met them before, took eight weeks of going through this program with them. And on the tail end of it, we're all like, should we, should we do this? And uh, in, in various capacities for each one, but Jesse, um, she'd worked in a few startups before and she was at the time looking to found a startup. So she was looking for IP. She was looking for things she could go do. And uh, we were early enough stage and, you know, we complimented each other well enough that uh, we gave it a trial period and said, hey, come check it out. Not, not, not hey, you're a co-founder on day one. It's, you know, come consult for the company for a few months, see how it fits. So, so the base is like getting married, right? Yeah. And so she's now the, the COO for the company and she's doing an excellent job, but it started out as, yeah, like, see if you get along with the team, see if the skill sets align, all that stuff. And I would recommend that every single time. Don't just go all in. Yeah, don't go to co don't go to co founders match and click on a button and you match yeah. with somebody. Yeah. That's the first step. And then you take months and months and months to figure out if it's a good fit before you move forward because personality fits and alignment, uh, you know, that can make or break a company. So what's the next position you're going to bring on to your company, you think? Full-time business development. Um, so, you know, sales has been essentially part-time consulting slash advisors helping me and, and, and Jesse as well do it. Like I, I've been doing most of that with help from uh, Nisi, who's been advising very well, but, you know, she's, she's had a, another job. And so filling that position full-time is going to be the next role. And then, uh, pretty quick after that is going to be kind of the manufacturing aspect. So um, we have, we have people kind of like that we're looking at for both those positions. Um, we're uh, working to close a funding round right now that gives us the ability to fill those full time. So for either position, talk through how you, you convince someone to take one of those positions. Like how do you incentivize them? How do you like convince them, motivate them that they should join you? How do you usually do that? Yeah, so the the first part is just making them a believer. So um, you know, showing them everything you can, um, indoctrinating them into the technology and how it's kind of like groundbreaking and how it's going to make a huge impact, and then really put that that mission piece in it, right? Like they're going to make a difference. Um, and then you know, I do believe in sharing the company too, as as far as equity. So you know, make make the key hires part owners of the company. So they have a stake in the game. And, you know, if they do a good job, that translates into their portion of the company being worth more, more money down the line. And so finding people that are interested in a combination of salary and equity, which is obviously, I'm not, that's nothing new. That's like extremely common for a startup, but um, I think it's very valuable. To, I think the challenge, like most people don't know what equity is, right? So you, you try to convince, you have to talk about dilution. You yep. know, like I tell people come up with me like, 
you have this prison equity, but in reality, I'm, I'm telling you, like, it's, it's prison equity, same as me telling you, hey, the pot will go there in rainbow, you'll get it right. Yeah. It's probably not going to happen right, but I don't want it to happen. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a conversation for sure, because if you've never worked in a startup, you have no idea what uh, what's being told to you, right? You like, like, so you want, me, options, you want me to work 80 hours a week for magic beans? <laughs> Yeah. And so it is an educational part too. And, so, you know, you have to show like, you know, yes, our company is early and here's where we want to get to. And if, and if we're successful, here's where we'll get to. And at that level of success, here's what these stock options or this equity is worth mm -hmm. and show that journey and say, it's not a guarantee. I'm not going to like pull the sheet over. Like it's not a guarantee. It means we have to work really hard and maybe we'll get there. But if we get there, this is what it pays off and turns into. Um, and that can't be everything, right? Every, people have families, people have responsibilities you need to pay to. Um, and there's a reason why we haven't done as much hiring yet. And it's because people cost money, people right? People cost money. Especially A plus players cost money. They do. And um, so, you know, we, we formed the company in November, 2020, uh, didn't pay any salaries until September, 2021. So I was working on it for free for a very long time and the rest of us were. Um, and so, you know, but now we're, you know, that that's why investment is important for tech startups, especially because there, there are just costs to growing quickly and you can't do it fast enough with revenue. And so, you know, getting the proper amount of investment where you can pay people and have a buffer uh, and do all of the growth in the product and R and D uh, it's a it's a balancing act. Yeah, it? it does no good to pay someone like a couple months at a time, right? Right. You got to yeah. invest at least in your salary in them, I would think. Yeah, yeah. And so so that's where we're at now, where we finally um, are raising the amount that allows us to go hire the people and pay them what they should be paid. And as opposed to, yeah, like consulting, kind of like, you know, small amounts that we feel bad about, but it's all we can do. But that's what everybody, every company has to do, unless you have the golden ticket of, you know, here's 20 million yeah. as an idea. Some people get that. I didn't, most people don't. No, most people don't. Yeah, especially as a hardware company. That's yeah. in Seattle. Yeah, that's a good point. Talk about being a hardware company in like a software place like Seattle, the channels with that. And are you raising all your money in Seattle? You own different places. Primarily raising in Seattle. Um, and I, it's just based on the connections and the network that I built. Um, it's very hard. It's very, very hard. Um, in Silicon Valley and other places, there are specific hardware focused groups, not so much in Seattle. So you essentially in Seattle, you find people that don't have a explicit software focus, even if they're most of their experiences there, it's not, they, they don't just like dismiss you right off the bat. And then you convince them how groundbreaking the technology is going to be. Um, so it's, it's been a hard road. It was, you know, as, as CEO of a company that's, you know, keep money in the account, hire good people. That's, you know, that's not it, but those are, if you fail at either one of those, you'll fail as a company. And so it's been a, it's been a year and a half grind for me. Um, but uh, we made the, we made enough progress and showed enough value to where we're now finally able to convert people that earlier on were like, well, hardware is hard. Um, you're like, no shakes for a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, like, tell, me I, I I don't, tell me something I don't know. But, uh, but the fact that we worked through a lot of the manufacturing challenges already, we have paying customers, we have, you know, people that have shown strong interest. Um, we have this, you know, dedicated team that's really passionate. Um, you know, a lot of these boxes were beginning to be checked to where, uh, and then once you get the first bigger check in the door, it becomes easier. So, and, and this, my, the, you know, the fundraising is not done for me, but we've just made a good amount of progress since, uh, you know, over the last month and a half, I guess, really. So Brandon, tell me how you're going to go against this. I think a lot of startup founders are grinding and they're raising money. Let's say they raise a million dollars, either relax or they buy some bullshit or like they buy like thousand dollar office chairs or like go crazy. Right. And yeah. then within two months, the money's gone. Right. Yeah. How are you going to guard yourself? How do you, how are you going to ring frugal as you are now? Well, don't go into it thinking you'll ever get any more money. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if I get this money, you know, how do I move forward thinking maybe this is the last money? So you can only go so far on that because you, the key in a startup is growing faster than other companies, right? So you do need to invest in growth. That doesn't mean you need to get the fancy office with ping pong tables and like, there's a place for that, but uh, early stage, not yet. So like we, we moved to, we moved to gig Harbor 
um, a little bit outside of Seattle, lower prices. Um, we could get more space and kind of like own what we were doing a little more. Um, and we can build out our, our footprint and do a lot more there for our money. Um, and you know, we're, we're, you know, if, if we're in the office at the same time, one of us has taken a meeting in a storage room, like we're, we're making it work for now. And we know that it's not forever, but, um, you can't take anything for granted. Um, and, and I think the other part is you just need to have it all planned out. <laughs> so you, you don't raise money and then decide what you're going to spend it on. Like there's very key things that you're going to spend it on. And you also need to keep this buffer in case. And because, uh, the next fundraising round will take longer than you expect like just guaranteed. And so that's kind of the approach I'm taking is, yeah, we're going to raise another round, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to plan as if it happens right away. So be frugal, pay for what we need to pay for to grow, but don't pay for anything extra. So being a star founder, like the product's a full-time job, tech's a full-time job, more, everything's, every little business thing is a full-time job. And on addition, then of course, fundraise like probably two jobs, right? How you prioritize your time, how you make sure you don't go crazy, don't get burnt out, like how you work with all that? Well, you know, a lot does fall on your shoulders and it, it will for a decent period of time. And so you're constantly thinking about it. You're constantly running through different scenarios. But, you know, going back to the team building and the people aspect, that's how you do it. You find the right people and you um, properly delegate things. Uh, that's a hard thing because, you know, you have such strong ownership and it's been you for the longest time. And I'm not going to say I'm the best at this, but, um, you know, you can only go so far on your own. And so finding the people that you trust to delegate things to and then uh, providing a system where they can own it. Right. And they show ownership over it. They can take some amount of control over it. Uh, we're, we're kind of like transitioning into that phase. Like I've had a ton of help. I've had a ton of help up till now, but we're now at the point where other people can truly own uh, some of these things that I've been owning for a long time. I can truly transition them over and trust that they're going to still make the progress needed and kind of like holding the expectations. So for your fundraising, what was your process? Do you like, did you like Google hardware uh, VCs and code email, warm introductions, any advice? How have you, have, have you done this so far? So I, tried to minimize any amount of cold reach outs in any aspect of the business possible. So fundraising, um, again, call it luck, call it network, whatever you want to call it. Um, I have a, a, somebody I graduated with that had formed a startup and was CEO and he was mentoring me early on. And I talked to him, he made some early introductions to some kind of local angel investors. We were too early for them. Uh, so I did reach out, but I, and I met them and I told them what they were doing, what we were doing and they gave some advice and we're too, too early and that's fine, but the seed was planted and I've gone back to them since. And, you know, just yesterday I pitched to one of the groups I was introduced to a year and a half ago for my friend. Um, but, you know, I did a deep dive in entrepreneurship. I did this Wharton business school thing, um, learned a lot about the process, like what, how should this happen? And there's a process, right? There and, is a process. And, 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 and no one tells you the process. You got to either have hard luck and learn the hardened lessons or, you know, be fortunate to learn it. Yeah. Yep. You go out of your way. You know, I was listening to all sorts of podcasts, reading all sorts of books, doing the Wharton class, doing all this stuff. Um, but I learned that I had to do a friends and family round. So as most people do. So, and I, I wouldn't specifically call it a friends and family round. It's part, like a, part of a Brendan door around. <laughs> well, no, it, was, it was a professional network round. Like some friends were in there, no family, but mostly like, you know, expanded professional mm -hmm. network of high net worth individuals, mm -hmm. pitching people, you know, that it's hard to do that because you're talking to a lot of people for a lot of mostly smaller checks. Um, we were able to get some larger checks in that. And so we raised uh, close to $400,000 in that way, just in a hundred conversations turns mm -hmm. into 40 people that are interested mm -hmm. turns into 20 people that invest or something like that. But uh, a lot of work to do that, but that allowed us to get to a working product, right? Not to hire a bunch of people, not to do anything else, just get to a working product, do some testing on it. Um, and then the progress made in that time allowed us to start having conversations with angel syndicates and seed level VCs. And so um, during that, I don't, we'll call it a year where I had raised the pre-seed round of about 400K, um, made the progress, you know, I was having discussions with the people that I 
envisioned would invest in us later when we were ready. So like one of the investors we're bringing on now, I started talking to them oh, seven months ago. Yeah, it's and, not, it's and, not, and, and I was yeah. pitch, uh, pitching, pitching with the intention that I knew they weren't going to invest now, yeah. but pitching to get them on board with our company and to watch us. Right. And they, and you know, six, seven months later, yeah, so you, so you were like sending updates to these people. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes sending email updates, sometimes just getting on calls periodically and saying, here's where we're at. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the process is just continually maintaining conversations, um, being mindful about, uh, where other people are at and, you know, not wasting their time too. Like I didn't go after a bunch of groups that mostly invest in software mm -hmm. because wasted yeah. my time in there yeah. found the people, you know, there's a big list, right? You can go through this list of who are all the people that invest in startups. And and there, people realize there's so many VC, so many angel investors out there. There's a lot. And you have to go across the names off that list that you know aren't, it's a waste of time. And so I, I went and I went through and said, no, 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 no. I don't want to waste your time. And I had a shorter list of maybes, mm -hmm. right? And so I started talking to them and I didn't start just talking to them. I said, how can I find a way to talk to them? Mm -hmm. Who do I know that knows somebody that knows them? And so did that process and, um, over it didn't work nothing happened right away um but over six seven eight months it finally started to turn into uh investment and then another thing i did uh was i put myself out there in investment competitions mm -hmm. that were more public and so that is harder it's a lot more work um a lot of time investment typically for a lot less money that oh, you, yeah. then you'd get from like a couple of conversations with a vc but it also gives a lot of information to you about your messaging um, some weak spots for your company, mm -hmm. they can just tell you, right? Like, Hey, this is why we don't like you. Mm -hmm. Here it is point blank. And it's like, okay, you got some tough skin. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we did it three times. The first time we didn't make it very far and they're like, you need customers and revenue. We're like, okay. <laughs> and then the second time we had customers and revenue, we had some, a lot of traction. We made it to the finals. It was Seattle angel conference, mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, 20, uh, the, SAC 20 cohort made the finals in that didn't win. We were, I, I think we were pretty close. Didn't win. Um, and then got a, a bit burnt out cause it was a ton of work, but then I, uh, put myself through it again. I did APIS health angels in our first cohort ever going through that. And that was more focused on healthcare based, uh, products and companies. And so I made the finals in that one as well. And then through that process, when you get in the finals of these competitions, you go into due diligence for about a month. And there's a team of investors and they're typically newer investors. Mm -hmm. I, that's the goal of those competitions is to train investors really. Um, and then you just get a ton of feedback, I'll put in a ton of work, you get a due diligence report and it spells out exactly what you're, where you're great and where there's still more questions. And so each of those learnings we took back and we said, okay, re-rack. Sometimes it's messaging, sometimes it's the product, sometimes it's an aspect of the company. Um, make an improvement, go try it again. And then after going through APIS Health Angels, um, we made enough progress and had enough visibility that we were able to finally start getting some traction in fundraising. Well, Seattle Agents Confident Apex Health Angels, is the, the pitch award money about the same? Yeah, the it's the goal is for them to be around a $200,000 investment if you win. So my question for you, right? Like Seattle Agents Conference, I'm a big fan of John C. Chris. Yeah. I love what he does, but man, yeah. you, you do a lot of work, right? A lot, a lot of work and like is like two hundred thousand dollars that's a lot of money but is all that work work really worth it you know we you know you're probably not going to win if you're looking at time invested versus money you get it's not worth it yeah. if you look at time invested feedback you get mm -hmm. you know improvements you make network you build mm -hmm. versus the money then i think it is worth it. worth it for us specifically we met enough people we learned enough we improved enough that, and we didn't even win. We didn't even get the two hundred thousand. I know a lot of people like what's it called? They like invest off offhand or something like that. Yeah. So, it I I would do it again. Uh, even though even though that parts of it I was so burnt out in the process that I it's crazy to think that I would say that. But uh, I would do it again, uh, and I think it was valuable. And I would recommend other startup founders do it, especially if you're kind of like just before taking off. If you're getting a ton of traction with uh, VCs and other investors, you probably don't need it. But if you're just before that stage, I think it might, it can put you over the top. Is Apex Health Angels part of Seattle Angel Conference or something different? It's APIS, Apis okay. Health Angels, Apis. Elizabeth Cross Nickel, um, she, uh, and John Seacrest. So, so it's essentially a spinoff of Seattle Angel Conference. And it's because there's not enough focus on healthcare companies and they're so different. 
they're very different from like software companies um, and traditional tech startups that it requires a different set of uh, knowledge and skills for the investors that are looking into the companies, right? They need to know, they need to know different questions to ask. And so they said, it's different enough that we'll have its own competition. And Seattle Angel Conference is more focused on Seattle-based companies. Mm -hmm. Avis Health Angels was, you know, not Seattle focused. It was, it was national. Um, I don't think there was companies from other countries. I can't remember, but um, yeah, there was, com there was companies from all over the country for sure. Even in the finals, it was, we might've been the only Seattle-based company in the finals. Uh, maybe two of us. And what you're doing is considered health tech, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're kind of an in-between, um, you know, in that competition, we were competing with drug development, with like medical devices that you implant with like a heart and preventing heart attacks. And, and I, that's not us, but um, we are providing a healthcare service. We're providing clean air quality in a room that improves a healthy environment and prevents people from spreading uh you know, disease between each other. So it's, it's on the border. It's like on the border of kind of like hardware technology, healthcare technology. And then in the, in a future state, we're going to have a uh, software-based technology in this where there's a, a lot of data that is going to be generated around clean air environments that companies can use to make better decisions and even kind of attract staff or customers to their facility because they keep it clean and safe for people. Um, that's not the focus for our company yet, but it will be a big part of our company moving forward. So it's like a little bit of a lot of things. Are you able to say to, to a potential customer, use a product, we're going to, we'll decrease something by this amount, increase something by this amount. So, so we've done third-party independent testing that's shown, uh, how, how much of an airborne aerosolized virus we kill in what period of time. And what we've shown with that is that we can do it faster than competitors and we can do it a lot cheaper. So we can kind of like disrupt existing products that are out there. Um, we're doing some additional testing with some universities that is, that's gonna be showing essentially prevention of transmission. So I'm sick, you're not, air is processed through our device, you, and, you wouldn't get sick. So that testing is not completed yet. So we can't like put that on our website, um, but we have, that's in progress right now. Um, but what we, what we have right now is, you know, we can kill, you know, COVID-19 surrogate virus very, very quickly um, and, you know, keep the levels in a room low enough that, uh, you know, could help prevent people getting sick. So let's say someone uses your product and I'll, I'll make this up, but it decreases the patching by 80%, right? And then they take the, the product out. How many days does it take to, to get the patching back to the previous level without your product in there? So the reason why it's valuable with using UVC light and have it continuously working is because at any given time, if somebody comes in here with COVID and sneezes, it's just a spike, right? It's back. But if it's in the room and continually processing the air, you quickly keep that at a, at a normalized level such that that spike that would be there if, it, if, if the unit wasn't in here, it's, it's a very small blip. And so you never cross the threshold of like uh, a level where you or I would get sick. And so that's the goal is per, minimize the, the spikes in the concentration of virus in the air. Is a product is like electric, electrical one, battery run? How does it actually run? It's a plug into the wall. Okay. Yeah. So it's, we don't have a battery on it. So it's uh, just uh, yeah, plug in powered. So a totally random question. And you might, may or may not, may not know. The air in the airplanes, are they clean, dirty, or should we be worried about that air in there? But they say they circulate it from the outside, but you know. So I'll be careful how I answer this one. But um, what I will say is, in general, um, they, they use HEPA filtration mm -hmm. on airplanes, and they move the air through there pretty quickly. Um, HEPA has kind of been the gold standard for air purification for a long time. And it works really well in a lot of cases, and I'm not going to knock it. We have a HEPA filter in our device, and that's for a reason because it works well. However, um, it doesn't necessarily stand up to the HEPA claims of 99.97% removal of 0.3 micron particles. Um, we've independently tested that, and that doesn't hold up. And so um, airlines hold pretty strongly to that we remove 99.97 percent here's our we have a solid filtration system here's what i'll say airplanes do a lot better job than other methods of public transportation way better bus train anything else it's going to be worse than an airplane and you have a lot of people on an airplane 
Um, it's, it's, it's not going to be removing 99.97% of things. It's going to be less than that. Um, I've gotten sick in the pandemic on an airplane. A lot of other people have too. It is what it is. If you need to fly, you're going to fly, but, um, I think we could make it safer. Talk about the article that GeekWire did on your company. GeekWire did an article essentially highlighting, um, in a similar way to this conversation, just how we formed, um, what we've been doing, the progress we've made, the team we've built. Um, and it was kind of just an indoctrination to who is Violet and what's, uh, and, and me as a founder and what, uh, what we've been doing. It was really cool. They're a great team at GeekWire. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it's a startup spotlight. That's what it was. So they just started that series again, where they're taking early stage startups and giving some visibility to it. So it was really cool. We, uh, we met a lot of people through that actually. Um, even some investors. Oh, good. I was about to ask that. What, what kind of benefit do you get out of that article? Like, did it pay off for you? It did. Yeah. We had a lot of people reach out through our website. Um, we had a spike in people reaching out on our website based on that article from Seattle, Silicon Valley, even. Um, it, it was obvious that they have good readership. So it was cool. So, so far, what's your take on the Seattle tech startup scene? What's your like opinion of that? What's your view on that? I think there's a really solid established group of people here. I think the investment in early stage startups, it's still a growing market and they're improving there. I think um, there's there's less opportunities than in some, some other areas for early stage investment, but um, you know, I think there's definitely enough that you can find, you can find it if you work hard enough. Um, and for a hardware company, it's really just extending the, the lifetime of those conversations a lot longer than it would be if you were a software SaaS company or something like that. Yeah, I think it's definitely a challenge of raising Seattle, right? Because I heard a lot of people joke was like, in Seattle, they expect you to have like an A round company for a seed round investment, right? Yeah. I've heard that before. Yeah. Um, and for early stage, you're typically looking at uh, s smaller investment checks. So you're getting checks from more people. And then you have to do more work for the smaller checks. You have to do more work for the smaller checks. Typically, the early rounds are more angel investment in mm -hmm. Seattle, whereas in Silicon Valley, there's plenty of seed level VC groups people that can write, write majority of the check or a bigger check. And, and then, yeah, it just takes a lot less time. Um, there's pros and cons, you know, when you get more people on your cap table, but potential that those people are value add, right? We, we have some investors that are extremely value add that we've found. Um, and this is another marriage, right? You're married to a co-founder, you're married to a board of directors, you're married to the VCs. Yeah. If and, you, if you bring on the big investment with the wrong person, that's another thing that can tank your company. So you're, you know, you got to manage all those people or the CEO, don't you? Yep. So, you know, if, if it's going right, you're interviewing them as much as mm -hmm. they're interviewing you. Um, when you're early stage, you're not always at uh, having the ability to like say no mm -hmm. as much as, as maybe you would otherwise, but I haven't had that experience so far to where like I've met somebody that um, obviously would have been a bad fit or what I said no to. Yeah. Um, I think someone's gonna be a joke. You can tell pretty, pretty soon if they're gonna be a joke or not. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I haven't, and I think maybe I was just selective in who I was talking to, but I haven't experienced that, which is really good for the Seattle startup community. But, um, yeah, you know, we, we've gotten some really good value add investors, um, you know, specifically with some manufacturing expertise and facilities that we're going to be able to utilize, which is going to be great. So we're going to be able to do our manufacturing, less expensive and more local than maybe we would have been able to do otherwise based on a relationship from an investor. So, so talk about the pros and cons of being an entrepreneur so far. So, um, for, for me, there's been a lot of pros in, uh, I, you know, I, uh, I'm kind of a hard charger driving type. And, um, when I, you know, I, I did my master's in systems engineering and that's kind of like, at a high level, seeing the best way for things to fit together, right? And how a system should be working. And so um, kind of when I map that out and chart this path, you know, when you have a startup, you can, yes, you, you bounce it off your team and validate you have alignment, but you can go, right? Whereas in previous jobs and working for the government and Department of Defense, it's like you see the path, you know, it's the best path. Uh, There's like 10,000 steps. Can't, you just can't do it. Like it's not, it's not allowed. It's against this or that funding's allocated over here or there. Um, you know, you can have the best idea in the world and it doesn't happen. And so, you know, having the autonomy to take, make, take the best path that, you know, is the best path. Like that's great. Um, and 
you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty freeing being able to create something from nothing and um, build a team and uh, build something really cool and help people. Um, you don't have that opportunity to truly help people as often as you'd like, or at least I haven't. So it's, it's, it's really great. And then the, the downside, it's all encompassing. Uh, it's typically at least early stage all on you. So a mistake that you make, nobody's going to fix it for you and you're solely responsible for the results. And so, um, you know, that's good and bad, right? Like I appreciate aspects of that. Um, but it's also just a lot more stressful in a lot of ways. Um, personal life takes a hit, uh, your fitness levels take a hit, like the things that I love doing, I don't do all that often. Like I really love the outdoors, uh, hiking, paddleboarding, running. I'm extremely out of shape. <laughs> I just, uh, I just signed up for a run, uh, like a, uh, a run with a group. So I, I haven't started training for it yet and I have this date looming. So I'm like stressed about that too. Cause I know that's gonna be painful, but, uh, but yeah, you know, there's downsides. It's at least until you get to a point where you have hired a staff that can run with things um you're gonna you're gonna own a ton of it and so you're just gonna there's other aspects um of your life that are gonna take a hit how, how you do this like you know like i like to say being a startup is not unicorn and rainbows all the time right i suppose something went around the company you're having a bad day a deal broke through whatever you like still keep on the happy face and motivate people or are you transparent with everyone hey it, it, you know this is sucking right now i need your help like how do you go to that process because some people say you always give me hunky dory motivated always a bright light, you know, cause you don't want to get, get your team down or your co-founder down. How do you do, deal with that? You need to have people you can talk to about the hard stuff and it shouldn't be everybody. Um, there is definitely something to be said leading from the front and showing that the vision and the, the direction you're going is, is a good one and you're going to get to a better place. And if you, if you start to be down and, you know, um, negative about a lot of things, they will too. And it's just, and, and, and it'll have impacts, far, far reaching impacts. So you do need to maintain composure and, and stay positive. You can still be transparent, you know, and upfront and say, this happened, things are gonna be harder right now because this happened, but you also need to say, here's what we're gonna do moving forward. You can't, you can't go to the team without the path. And this, this happened, we're screwed, <laughs> right? You can't say that. You quickly not have a you team. Can, you can think that when it happens and then you can say, okay, so what are we going to do differently? And then go to your team and say, all right, reality check. Some bad thing happens. We need to work harder as a team for a period of time to make it better. Uh, and if we do, here's going to be the results. And so presenting the path from the bad thing is, can be motivating and it's, um, but you also need to have an outlet too. And that's hard. Um, sometimes it's isolated and you don't have a lot of people to talk to, but that's, that's where advisors come in really well. So setting up an advisory board that has people that have been through the CEO job and or whatever job you're doing in your startup that you can go talk to. Do you think having like a bad time in your startup well, actually, is actually good for you because you have a bad time, but it's sort of the middle of your people. Like you had a bad time, but if something's good, everyone's doing what they want to do, something's bad. It, 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 so you're like, who's going to quit on you, so to speak? Yeah, I think, I think if things are too easy, people will get complacent. Um, I, I just started reading the book, Amp It Up. Uh, it's the Snowflake CEO. And he talks about maintaining a consistent amount of urgency in the environment. Even if things are going really well, if you get complacent and kind of uh, ease up as a startup, you know, that can kind of seep into the culture. And then very quickly, you will not be doing so well because things change so fast in a startup and competitors pop up out of nowhere. Um, so always, you know, even if things are great, you know, what's the next thing we're working towards? Set the expectations and drive hard towards that. Even, even though, you know, it's not, it's not going to be the end of the world. If you don't meet it, you, you should treat it like it is. Uh, Cause you know, maybe, it, you know, maybe it will be the end of your world as a startup because there's something else happening over there that you don't know about yet. So always having that hard drive. Um, but like you're saying, if, if things are harder, it will bring out the uh, best and the worst of people. So you will learn earlier on, um, especially if you're early with the team, um, you'll have less investment in a person that might not be able to go through the hard stuff. So that's, uh, that's definitely true. And you said you have a board of advisors. Yeah. So I, my, my, 
Mike Moyer is my business uh, uh, attorney, and he's the again the the family connection that I talked about that turned into a rock star lawyer in the Seattle community. I was lucky to have uh, available to us. He's been a really solid mentor for me as well early on, um, and he gave me the advice to consider in your head who like your like a team or your rock star team would consist of and not the people but like the the specific roles like if somebody had this expertise specifically and like make four or five like sets of like maybe the gaps and like find the experts in these gap areas and then do the work of saying like okay does anybody in my extended network have that skill set if not does anybody in my extended networks extended network right like go down the path of like who fits these roles and then even beyond that say like who's the most world renowned person of this right because typically for an advisory board member it's not a massive commitment on their part um and typically they're more honored for the uh request than anything else you go to them and you say hey you're an expert i respect you a ton i have this startup i'd love to just get advice from you once a month and i'll give you some equity to go with mm -hmm. that what do you think and that's not always the case. Sometimes they just won't respond, right? Mm. And and that's and that's fine because especially if you go for like the celebrity type, like yeah. in my case, like my celebrity scientist type or whatever, um, it's fine if they don't respond. But if they do, you know, that might be a huge step up for your company. So um, that makes it sense to do pretty early. Um, and what I found is that reaching out to advisors early and getting people on board. So there's validation of company, right? Validation mm -hmm. of the company, but also has created these opportunities to convert those people to employees mm -hmm. because they're bought in early. And if the opportunity presents itself, then it's somebody that's ready to jump, make the jump instead of trying to recruit cold. So how do you take care of yourself? Well, <laughs> well I, I'm, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking like me, like I suck at that. So I'm thinking you're gonna say this about the same thing. Yeah, I, it's been really important to me my whole life, and I've struggled with it. Um, I have a trainer that I meet with once a week. I have to cancel more often than I'd like to say, but we have a standing appointment. And that was a huge step because in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when gyms closed and everything, I built a home gym and I just wasn't using it. And I realized I needed to, I lost my routine. And so I needed to insert some accountability. So I got the trainer um, and I still have, I still have that, but like I said, I have to cancel sometimes. Um, for me, I, I'm starting to build in more forced accountability to take care of myself. So, you know, setting expectations with other people to go do things. Um, but, uh, you know, I typically try to, you know, eat healthy food and at least get one or two workouts in a week. Uh, my, my wife, uh, she's probably busier than I am. And she also has been working out like every day. And so I'm like, okay, okay so it can happen. I'm just not doing it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just tough to take, it's tough to carve the time out. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's a mind trick too. Cause you know, mine, like I know my work only be like 30 minutes an hour, but that's 30 minutes an hour, you know, well, not only is like 30 minutes an hour, but you probably have to travel to the gym, get dressed. That's like two hours out of your day. Yeah. I mean, you think of everything I can do on the, on the business in these two hours, right? It becomes tough to, tough to justify, but the productivity, like, and I know this too. Oh, yeah. The oh, productivity yeah. Oh, yeah. that you have. When you work out, your day is so much better. It's totally true, but still, I skip it a lot of times because I just get so caught up and busy with everything that's going on. But um, it's, I'm, I'm always thinking about it. Um, do you work out in the morning or after, in the afternoon? I've done both. Um, I've historically been more of an afternoon Are workout you? person, but um, working out in the morning before a workday, it does definitely give a lot of energy. Um, so every time I've done that, I've appreciated it, but uh, you know, I, I work late sometimes and sleep is nice too. So well, what's, what's your sleep schedule like? Are you like one of the Elon Musk people like, like sleep four hours a day and, and operate? You got to get eight, eight, and eight to seven to eight. Um, I'd say six is pretty typical, yes, um, but you know, we've done it. Like I said, we've done plenty of all nighters mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm definitely the type. And I think this is part of the military, uh, mindset that's been built into me. Like if something big was happening and it had to be done, oh, yeah. There's you, no just, sleep. you just wouldn't go home. You might get a cat nap here and there. You and... Just keep working. And so I did that enough working with the military that at, when it's happened here, 
um, I've just kind of powered through and done all nighters and then you get a little sleep the next day and just make it work. Um, that catches up with you, obviously. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the bad part about it too, is not everybody is wired that way. And no. so I need to be careful about it, yeah. um, to not burn the team out too. Right. So, um, yeah. Have you thought about doing a Kickstarter? Yeah, we have, we, because we focused B2B and we have this product that's more kind of geared towards medical facilities. Mm -hmm. We haven't done it yet, um, but we're considering a direct to consumer product and having essentially building out into two products. One that would be more for somebody in their home and that's more appropriate for a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, and, and I'd say we're, we're getting closer to that. And so, yeah, I'd be excited to, to do that. And we're, we're going to look into it more. It's more marketing than anything else, yeah, which I definitely. know you know. Yeah. So we would need to gear up on the marketing side a little more. We haven't done that yet. We've been focused on direct sales. We have some marketing materials, but before we do a Kickstarter campaign, we'd need to really double down on building an audience and building uh, excitement behind our products, getting social media advertising going, things like that, and then do the Kickstarter campaign where people just flock to it. So is there such a thing as a perfect customer for your perfect industry for your product? Up front, it is the perfect industry for us is is kind of like healthcare related. So because they have an understanding of the science. And that's really beneficial before we've fully built up a brand. If you understand the science, you can see why our product is better than other products. And you can look at the test results we have and say, okay, I can see the validation and the value. If you're just a general consumer, they can be more influenced by kind of what's on the box and what advertisement they see on social media. And the reality of the industry that I'm in, companies can say a lot of things that might not be even true and so it's easier to sway um with kind of like misleading claims or uh yeah so health health healthcare is good for us because they're forced to do their diligence for a purchase and that's what we need because we have a product that's superior but we don't have a brand and like massive marketing campaign yet to influence how does your product deal with like, like cigar smoke, cigarette smoke, or any like, kind of smoke like that? Yeah, we have a really, uh, really robust filter. And so it's going to handle that just as well as any other air purifier that, it, that excels in that. Um, we, we made sure that we could check all those boxes too, because we knew in some way we'd, even though we're geared to kill viruses, we knew that we'd be judged against all those other companies that are geared to remove pollen and dust and smoke. And we'd be, you know, the same tests would be run on ours, even though it's not viruses, you know, they're going to be, they're going to say like, Hey, this other air purifier pulls smoke out better than that one. So therefore this one's better, even though this one doesn't do very much for viruses. So, so we made sure we got a really robust pre-filter and HEPA filter system set up so that we can pull smoke, large particulate pollen. Uh, you know, we're, we're, incorporating a solution that's going to have um, some of the best odor removing technology in the world. The standard is activated carbon for that. And we have a technology that can go with our pre-filter that's going to improve odor removal too. So how do y'all go about doing like research and development? Like, do you like get some random virus from our lab and run it through the system? Like how do you, how do you do all that kind of research and development stuff? So what we did primarily is, uh, one of the benefits of the fact that UVC lights are really old technology is it's actually been tested on all known pathogens. And we have this report, they essentially have this report that summarized all testing on all pathogens ever. And it says how, what the UVC dose required to kill those germs is. And so for us, what we focused on is let's learn our UVC dose. Let's learn what UVC dose we provide because we already have the data peer reviewed independent data showing if you have this dose, then you kill this virus or this bacteria or this mold. And so we focused on, okay, let's get the dose down. And then after we had that, we went to a third party lab that aerosolizes a virus or a different pathogen in the air and you turn your unit on and then it gives you direct results on how, how much you kill. And so that's what we did. Talk about the history of the name of your company, how that name come about. Is there a meaning behind it or is this a random name? So, you know, there's the obvious play on ultraviolet light violet uh it's it's with two t's and so ultraviolet light was discovered by a german um scientist and so violet with two t's is the german spelling of of the word violet so that's kind of how that came about um 
you know, obviously unlimited potential for naming a company. Mm -hmm. And um, I went through, I had a list of maybe a hundred plus names, narrowed it down and I bounced it off a, a number of different kind of trusted friends and advisors. And, you know, on the tail end, obviously having a domain available to purchase is, is a factor. Oh, as well. Yeah, that's that feel don't You know, the days ago, you had to, you have the .com, .io, make sure all the social media things are there, you know, make sure no one has it in another country. And of course, you got to make sure like it doesn't mean something negative in another language too, you know. Yeah. Yep. That, and, and we were also considering, you know, one of my, one of my good friends and an advisor for the company is a UX guy and considering what that name translates to and kind of the marketing value of it too. And like what you can do with it, you know, Violet uh, to, to us, there was a lot of possibility mm -hmm. with that versus something more sterile and like medical. And yeah. You definitely want like a medical bland name because yeah if you look at it, a lot of like air purifiers and air disinfectants, it's boring it's a lot of boring bland sterile type of names and so we wanted something that you know could have some, some excitement uh, some pizzazz yeah yeah exactly so that's how we did that and, and like i said the domain we was able to no negotiate our domain as well which that took a long time too but it's important some of these people domain names they want some crazy amount of money right like are you they kidding do. me like they do like that, that, that's my name. Like, how do you know my name? Right. <laughs> yeah. And it's because they know they can charge it and it's, it is what it is. But yeah, um, I, luckily we, we were able to negotiate it down to a reasonable price and I did that fairly early on. So that was like, you know, my money going towards it as opposed to uh, revenue or business money or. So what do you do for fun? <clears throat> I really, so I, I have two kids. I spend most of my time hanging out with them. Um, but I, we try to do outdoor activities. I mentioned, I live in Gig Harbor. We'll, we'll go paddle boarding and I'll take my daughter out uh, on a paddle board out there. Um, I really like to have some sort of challenge. And maybe again, that's kind of the military, like competitive. I was very sports oriented growing up, um, but like uh, you know, summoning Mount Rainier or like doing Spartan races or those types of things. I, I love. I'm pretty much like an outdoor then. person then, outdoor yeah, nature. I, that's what I enjoy doing. I don't do it enough. Kind of, I don't spend enough time on it, but that's what I enjoy doing. So how do you like, like you have all these things going on, like for example, tomorrow, I'll make this up. Suppose you have 20 things to do tomorrow on your priority list. How do you make sure you do things one to two versus starting from number 18? Well, setting the top priorities for the company and then aligning activities with, with that. Sometimes there's meetings that don't align and sometimes I take them, um, but other times I move them because they don't align with the current priorities for the company. Um, that's, that's the majority of it is just knowing, knowing the two to three big rocks that you have to focus on and then focusing activities there. And it's kind of easy for me right now because it's like fundraising. If it's not fundraising, uh, I, I'll spend time on it, but not much. And then the other piece of it is I, I do a lot of the engineering development, like higher level. I'm not doing the, as much of the hands-on like CAD engineering, things like that, but um, just the, the bigger, longer range development of the product that takes a lot of my time too. So those are kind of the two things that take up majority of my time right now and anything else, um, I'm finding, I'm finding ways to either delegate it or just say no to it. Just say no to it. Uh, I've been doing that more and more. It's hard to do that up front. It's, so one thing that I'm sure you're aware of and other people will find when they start their company is like people come out of the woodwork starting to Let's, talk to you. I want to be a coach. I want to be a partner, you know, but they want, they want to be a part of it. No, they give you no value. Right? Let's put this on the website and make money together. Like, no, yeah. you know, like, yeah, it's uh, and you know, everybody and, and I, I try to be good about it too, because I know at some point I'll be cold reaching out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do try to respond as much as I can. Um, but typically there's 10 people asking for, to provide services for the same thing. And it's mm -hmm. typically for something you already have, but that's going to be something that you never experienced before you formed a company. And so yeah. now I'll have 20, 25 people reaching out to provide services and help. Yeah. And, and cool thing is sometimes it's actually very valuable. Yeah, definitely. And so I've, I've found some really strong relationships from those reach outs, uh, that, that if I hadn't responded, I never would have, but there's a, there's a limit to it. Right. And if, yeah. if, if I'm focused on something extremely important, I, I will give it the most minimal amount of time possible and focus on the things that are important. Yeah. This happened to me a couple of times. People reach out to me on LinkedIn across. I'd look where they have, Oh crap, you know, them, I'm trying to get in touch with them. So, you know, this is perfect, right? Yeah. And in Seattle, I mean, that happens a lot. It's a yeah. small community in the grand scheme of things for startups. 
Yeah. Um, so you already talked to somebody at your company, but can you go like more detail how it got started, what you focus on now, and what you see the future for your company? So the company started, like I mentioned, um, kind of from the realization that current products for air disinfection weren't working and having this idea for how we could do it and having this realization that people in vulnerable populations were really struggling and we had a product that could help. So it's like, let's go do this. Let's do it as fast as we can. And, you know, current or, you know, focus up until now was building a product, proving that we could, that the product worked as well as we hoped it would, and then proving that we could manufacture the product while also proving customers were willing to buy it, right? Those were the things we needed to go validate. And now we're transitioning into the stage where we want to hire some core people that can scale all of those things. So scale manufacturing, scale our sales effort, and then start to do some of the things that we're excited about that we haven't had time to do, which is going to be launch our mobile app with our embedded sensors to add in that data aspect. Um, I, I'm really excited about that. And I think that's going to be huge for our company. Uh, it's really just putting in the time and we, we have an advisor, you know, in he's a, he's a CTO of a software company. And I met him through that Wharton business school class that I did. That was one of those things you take the you, opportunity you to put yourself out there. You never know what's going to pay off. Yeah. And so I met two people through that Wharton program that are involved in the company, Cy Prakash, um, he's CTO of Mindstack, which is a really exciting up and coming project management uh, software company. And then um, SK Panda, who's a really knowledgeable, experienced guy in the tech industry, is an investor and an advisor for the company, both of them through the Wharton program, but uh, gearing up with them to launch a mobile app. And that's, that's a big, big thing we're working on right now too. So next question, I, I'll make this totally up. Like what you have on your, on your, on your list of things, you have a hundred things to do, right? Every day you might get knock out one to six, but like number 70 to 100 is always on there. Like it's important to you, but you never get to it. Like what comes to the point where you're just like, okay, I haven't done 70 to 100 in like six months. Obviously it's not a problem to take it off. You delegate it. Like it's stuff like, you know, you need to do like whenever you see it, when you come across that, man, I haven't done that yet. It annoys me. Like, how do you handle that? It annoys me. <laughs> uh, just leave it at that just annoys you no no uh, <laughs> so sometimes i delegate it and i've been doing better about that because you know it's it's tough to it's especially when they're they are tasks that are are your tasks uh and it's not like explicitly with you know this engineering member or this ops member like it's yours but you just don't have time to do it uh i've found more and more the ability to provide a little bit of background and turn it over because I know it will happen quicker that way. Um, and then <laughs> I've only started thinking about this, but uh, kind of getting a, an assistant type to handle those types mm -hmm. of things. Cause typically those things, obviously if you're not doing them, they're not critical and they just take time. And typically it's something that you can train. And so I'm looking into that now uh, to be able to work through those less important, but still important mm -hmm. items that take a lot longer to get to. And for me, the thing that forces me to do them is like, I, I create systems that will like flash <laughs> in my face. You haven't done this yet. And it'll annoy me enough that I'll just, okay, I'm going to, you know, take 15 minutes less time and, you know, eating food or whatever. And I'm just going to knock it out. So your early morning rise or more of a night owl? More of a night owl naturally, night owl. but I have, I have young kids, so I get up. Oh, yeah. Day. So it's 24 7 <laughs> operations in the Doyle yeah. house, right? Yeah, exactly. So talk about the points of having your, 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 your close friends, spouse, and family like supporting you. It's one of the hardest things. Um, I've, I've set up a system where like I have this dedicated time with, that I focus on family. Like, no matter what's going on, here's the hours that I'm going to be at home with the kids and the wife. And I've been lucky enough to not have to travel very much. Uh, yet for the company, you know, you can do so much virtually. We've been able to do Zoom meetings, things like that. But uh, I've learned a lot about the best way to do it. I haven't done it the best way the whole time. You know, it's with so much in the air and juggling so many things, you know, communication is definitely at the forefront. And it's something that I constantly try to be better at. But um, yeah, prioritize it. You know, how old are your kids? Five and two. And so your wife, was, your, was your wife like, so you're telling me you want to do a startup now with the young kids? Like, what are you doing to me? 
Yeah, she's really entrepreneurial. She uh, she runs a number of different nonprofits mm-hmm. and associations, uh, and she's extremely talented. But yes, essentially, like now, now you want to do this now? Yeah, yeah, um, and I, it, I, I'm pretty stubborn too. So you know, I I knew the opportunity and I knew it needed to happen. And so uh, again, I have a lot of room to grow. I could have been better through that whole <laughs> that whole thing, um, but. There, there's there's not much more you can say that part of it's really hard and if you don't have somebody that you're with that's uh on board and understanding it's it's gonna be really hard talk about this um i think on my experience most people start a company and i'm generalizing i must I have this great idea and i'll be rich in six months or everything's gonna be easy right i mean talk about you know the patience the the time restraints the time all that kind of stuff you have to take it affected because they, they say this thing takes six, seven years. Like I say all the time, like Steve Jobs didn't come out for like eight years, right? You know, Facebook took quite a bit of time, you know, it's. It is not a get rich quick scheme, like not even close. Um, you know, the, the things that get publicized are, you know, they show Facebook's rise. And yeah. These, these, like, Some random company raises $10 million over to quote unquote overnight, you know? Yeah never the case and you just need to understand that it is a long game and if you're not willing to put in the work without the reward for a very long time it's definitely not worth it and the reward is definitely not guaranteed right that you look at the numbers of what percentage of startups you might as well play the, you might as well play a lot or play blackjack at the scene every day you probably have better returns yeah and, and also if you, if you look at you know the the people that leave high paying jobs to do startups even if the startup successfully, you know, is acquired mm-hmm. or things like that, often, you know, with you're weighing the risk of it, it's it's usually a better bet to stay with the high yeah. company. But what you get from entrepreneurship is different. Oh yeah, no you doubt. Have autonomy. You you can be creative. Make a difference. Make a difference. You impact other people's lives. And so if that's what's important to you, you should do it. If it's about the payday, you shouldn't do it. Yeah, because- like like with you, you have like these interns. If you're still in the Navy, you never really impact these interns' life, right? You, you can impact them, mentor them, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, get give people opportunities that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, there's a lot of ways that a startup is great, but it's it's it shouldn't be for the for the big payday. If it comes, that's awesome, but you shouldn't expect it. So, as an entrepreneur, you, you hear no all the time. How do you how do you do personally deal with like asking ten things and hearing no like all ten times? So what I've tried to do is if I have no control over it, like if, if worrying about it, doing anything about it, isn't gonna change the outcome, I don't, I don't dwell on it at all. So, you know, I take the lesson learned from it. If it's a no, here's why, take the here's why, move on to the next thing. Uh, if, if it's a no, but you get a sense that it's a maybe, you know, pencil that down, circle back in six months, but you're right, it's, you know, a hundred no's to every yes. And how do you deal with this? Like suppose, you, you're, suppose you're pitching come to our, your company and they basically say, hey, this is a waste of time. Your baby is ugly. Mm-hmm. There's no way you can make any money. Like how do you deal with that? Cause people say, don't take it personal. You know, what's talking about like, it, it's your company, right? How do you not take it personal? So you, before you start that whole process, you have to truly believe that what you're offering is valuable mm-hmm. and, and it's more valuable than other competitive companies. And if you truly believe that, then you can move on pretty easily from that because you just didn't properly explain to them or their mindset is pretty fixed in this way for a certain reason and they don't see your side. And you, you just use it as an opportunity to figure out a way to crack in and, and help enlighten them to, to why it's true, right? If you, don't, if, if you didn't believe that you know, your product was great or that you were providing, making a difference, it would be really bad because you're like, well, okay, they see it, I see it, it's done, right? But if you truly believe, then you can move on from it and just take every no as a lesson learned. For how and and then if some random person gives you negative feedback and you like believe it, like, did you really believe in your company in the first place? If some random guy sold you something negative, you're just gonna give up. Yeah, exactly. And you know, what I'll what I'll do sometimes is uh, if I if I get a no, I will ask for you know ask for the why the why is the important part right Mm -hmm. and that's that's where you can take value and and take it on to the next person how you deal with this like i like to say like the resumes and pitch decks are the same right 
Because if you give a resume to 25 people, you get 25 opinions. Do a pitch to 25 people, 25 different opinions. How do you like cut through the noise and deal with all the different opinions? How do you take what you need and like kind of like push off what you, what you don't think is valuable? Well, you do it for long enough, you start to hear all the different opinions over mm. and over again. Um, you're right though, everybody thinks about things a little bit differently. And so you need to, it's just, it's just a job of honing your responses into, into what you've heard. And so coming up with uh, the answers that don't trigger either side of the spectrum, mm. right? Because <laughs> there's- there's this is hard to do sometimes. It is, it is. And, you know, even with fundraising, you'll, you, you know, there you can do a safe you can do a convertible note you can do a price round and yeah. every person you talk to wants something different for a different reason yeah. but it's at a certain point you just need to make the decision for what you're going to do for your company and do it and say this is what i'm doing yeah and if they say but why not this you say, because we're doing this mm -hmm. this is what we decided to do for these reasons right? yeah it's because i'm invested i only do safe only do this you know of course you have no idea what they want to do or not do you know yeah. You know, it kills me too. It's been a pet peeve of mine. Like you do, like the pitch competition. We we'll say it's three minutes, right? You do, a, you do your pitch, or whatever. All the time, someone will say, "Well, you didn't have this slide. You didn't have this. Didn't have this." And you, and, and you want to say in your mind, "Well, because I only had three minutes, and the director said only eight slides. The director only said this, right? Because you can't say that. Right? You just got to take it on the chin. And like, yeah. yeah, thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your feedback. Very, very valuable. You know, but, but you really want to say, "Look here, jackass. <laughs> you know the rules just like I do. They yeah. told me three minutes, yeah. only eight slides. I had to cover this." Yeah, no, it's it's totally true. Like every every shorter pitch I've done, you you get the unreasonable feedback, and you just take it on the chin. It's, yeah, there's, it doesn't like, matter. Thank thank you. Still might have another. Yeah, because you if you if you do what you want to do, you look bad, and you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's like if, if you're looking professional. If you gave me ten minutes, it would have been a perfect pitch with everything you wanted. Yeah, with three minutes, you're gonna get a very small bit of every part that you want to see. So, what's been the most challenging part of fundraising so far for you? Well, it took, it took a while to really figure out what the package needed to be to get to some yeses. Uh, early on, you know, you get feedback and you make the corrections and then you find that it's still a no and you're like, okay, so that wasn't it. Or, or you pitch someone else and they're like, what's this crap in here? And you think it was, well, so-and-so told me to put in there, you know? Yeah. And so the process of getting to a point where not universally, but, a, you know, pretty much there's agreement that it's like investable. Mm -hmm. It was a long process. How many versions of your pitch deck have you done so far? <laughs> I don't even think I can count. Yeah, that. it's pretty high, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it changes uh, very, very frequently. I'd say, you know, major changes, probably the fourth, okay. but each of those four change yeah. about every week. What, what kind of tools do you use like on a daily basis? Like it's like Asana, Slack, any like productivity tools you use? I use DocuSign all the time. Mm -hmm. I use Calendly all the time. Yeah, I couldn't live without Calendly. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We use QuickBooks. I'm in there a lot. Uh, we use Smartsheet right now, and we're using that, and we enjoy that. Um, let's see. Yeah, those are the those are the main tools, kind of computer-based tools. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Brand, is there anything that I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet, or anything else you want to talk about? Well, um, I think we've talked about majority of the things I wanted to. I'd say if you, anybody that wants to learn more, uh, we have a, essentially a get in touch with us on our website where we sold business to business majority of this time. We're just now starting to, now that we're able to manufacture more, we're able to open this up to more uh, people, more places, more things. So, you know, it's a cool opportunity if somebody sees a situation or has a need to create a healthy, safe environment for themselves or their family or other people, they can reach out and we can have a discussion about if it's the right fit. And are you still doing your beta program? So yeah, it's not a beta program. We're, we're just selling the product now, okay. um, but we're selling to businesses. So we don't have a, we don't have a marketplace where you go buy it, but if you get in touch with us or if you get in touch with me, you know, we, and I guess we you ship it to them through the mail or something. Yeah. Yeah. We can ship it or deliver it. Uh, Brandon, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah, on LinkedIn, it's uh, uh, Brandon. It's just Brandon Doyle. Um, just my just my name. Uh, and let's see, Twitter. Our Twitter is Violet EVC. We're not very active on Twitter. That's something I need to improve as a founder. Um, and 
yeah, those are, LinkedIn's the best for me. I'm on, I'm on there the most. Okay. And so listen, we have the links to your show notes. Link to is the um, social media show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshobla.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends and network and subscribe, rate, review the Jason Cabinet experience. So Brandon, we're coming over talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Advice? Uh, I would definitely say it's all about the people. So surround yourself with people that are better, smarter, improved from you in some capacity and don't be the, don't try to be the king of everything. So be willing to have the smartest people in the room around you and rely on them and you'll be much more successful. And that's probably the biggest advice I could get and just have high expectations for everybody. Brandon, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.